Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Dear participants, thank you very much for joining us here once again. I hope that everyone had taken their break and had a refreshing lunch. And now we're coming back to continue with our sessions. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we are going to discuss bridging the digital skills divide. And with our moderator, Ms. Sophie Maddens, Chief of Digital Knowledge Society Department, ITU. So please, let's welcome our dear panelists and moderator on stage. And she'll have the privilege of introducing her panelists. Good luck. Thank you very much, Sarah. And welcome, everybody. I hope you enjoyed the delicious lunch that was offered by our gracious hosts. It is my honor and pleasure to moderate this session today. And I note, Alfie, we have a majority of women on this panel. I'm even more proud to be in a panel with many women and men as well. So my name is Sophie Maddens. I'm the chief of the Digital Knowledge Society Department in ITU. And on my panel today, I have Mr. Alfie Hamid, Head of Global Strategic Partnerships of Cisco. I have Ms. Iris Magali Pretel Trejo, IT Training Specialist in Inictel Uni Peru. I have Ms. Giovanna Botani, the Director of Operations of the ST Foundation. I have Ms. Ajeng Kusumaning Ratri, Assistant Vice President, CSR Education and Community Development of Indosat Oridu Hutchinson, Indonesia, and Ms. Abina Niamesem, the lead of Secure sustainability and partnerships of GIFEC in Ghana. So please join me in welcoming all of these great panelists to this particular panel. Digital skills, bridging the digital skills divide, essential, and it's core to the three days we will spend together to discuss. Because digital impacts on all sectors and all aspects of our lives. Looking at the sectors, think of e-health, e-education, e-agriculture, e-government, e-medicine. Think of the innovation opportunities for value creation, but the skills needed for adoption and the infrastructure for access. As the director said this morning in his opening statement, 3.6 billion are still unconnected. So today there is and must be a sense of urgency to connect everyone, but it's not just about infrastructure development. Yesterday we were at the ITU Academy Training Center uh, meeting and the director mentioned there are three things that we must focus on. We must bridge the digital divide. We must bridge the digital skills divide. And we must be innovative. We must think of bringing innovation into everything we do. So expanding connectivity is not enough. And we have to think, just as we were briefing this afternoon, Alfie, we have to think about bridging that digital divide for everyone people in unserved and underserved areas across income, gender, and age groups. And let's not forget persons with disabilities. So we must think of everyone. Because as COVID showed us, when we were locked down, there are these new and deeper divides for vulnerable groups. So let us think about digital skills for all. Because one of the main barriers of accessing and using the internet and closing that digital divide is still the lack of knowledge and skills of people on how to effectively use digital skills, digital technology, and of the benefits that all of this can bring. So this session will look at those who are still not using digital technologies, and together we'll explore the skill needs that will help bridge those digital divide. So we'll explore issues such as the internet usage gap and those specific groups that need particular attention. And I'm really proud to have our DTC, our Digital Transformation Center partners with us to learn from those examples. And again, I, I insist, let's think of the elderly. I'm three away, years away from pension. And as you can see, we do slow down and we do have hitches. 
and glitches, persons with disabilities, farmers, or women in rural and remote communities. We'll also look at the intergenerational skills gap, and we'll hear examples of successful digital skills initiatives that contribute to closing that usage gap. And together, we'll look at some concrete solutions, actions, and tools that can help achieve the SDGs through inclusive digital capacity and skills development. So let me turn first of all to Alfie, Alfie Ami Hamid. You have four minutes. In 2019, ITU and Cisco launched the Digital Transformation Centers Initiative to provide underserved communities with basic and intermediate digital skills training opportunities. So can you tell us how this initiative addresses the digital skills gap? And please share with us some of the main barriers to digital literacy and how we can support those that are still unconnected or those that still have difficulties using their connectivity to obtain those digital skills required to engage meaningfully in the digital world. Alfie, the floor is yours. Great, thank you, Sophie. And uh, to all of us who've had lunch and we all of it, uh, I was struck by what the early panelists have said. Uh, when you look at digital skills, it can be something that makes the lives of a lot of people easy, but also makes the lives of a lot of people difficult. And this is what the DTC is about. The Digital Transformation Centers is about making everyone's lives easy when it comes to digital skills. If we look at the program since we started, we had trained so far over 360,000 individuals. Now, what is the partnership about? It's about saying that no individual organization can do everything on its own. You know, in Africa, I'm, I'm South African, we have a saying in Africa that it takes a village to raise a child. And this is what the initiative is about. It's about bringing organizations with different strengths, like, for example, the ITU, which is good at administrating and managing an initiative, then bringing in our telco partners like Indosat, who will come in with the connectivity and with devices, and then bringing organizations like SD Foundation, who brings resources for people with disabilities, and then bringing in governments, like uh, you have GIFEC in Ghana, which then helps to bring in the facilities as people that we, and people that we can train who can take those digital courses to the communities. And then lastly, you have organizations like Cisco, which brings in the digital content. Now, how does it help? It helps address the challenge, for example, of access. Now, yes, you have a whole lot of digital costs way around it, but how do you make sure that the communities have access to it? And this is what the partners do. We make sure that that content is taken to the most difficult communities out there. You find that there's a lot of easy win initiatives, right? A lot of companies tend to go to uh, those initiatives that you can get very quick wins and good stories. But the most difficult portion of part is to go to underserved and deep rural communities, to work with people with disabilities. And there you will find the outliers. So we are the outliers. The people that you see are the outliers. Because we go after solving difficult challenges, <coughs> taking the difficult, uh, digital skills to those who do not have access to it. So what we do as an initiative, we bring in the content that we give to governments, we bring connectivity, so that the underserved communities can come into the digital age. We provide devices, and we make sure that the training of trainers is transferred to the government. So the sustainability is also built into it. So there's no dependency that the DTC initiative needs to stay around forever so that digital skills development can continue. So most importantly is transferring all of those assets over to you as a government so that you can continue to expand that initiative in your country. So that is what the initiative is about. And hopefully, hopefully we are in the Middle East, where I think there are quite a few countries here that can come on board to support the initiative. So I would say Bahrain, one of the countries, your neighboring countries, let's see how you can come together and help support us to 
bridge that digital divide. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, Alfie, and indeed, uh, some very good points there. Let me turn now to Ms. Iris Magali Pretel Trejo. Reaching those individuals and communities that are most at risk, as Alfie mentioned, uh, are at risk of being left behind, it is a difficult undertaking. So as an academic institution, INICTEL UNI is contributing to bridging the digital divide through its work and program. So can you share more information with us about the digital skills gap in Peru and what you're doing to address this digital skills gap, gap to bridge the divide? And can you also share with us how you're reaching, because Alfie mentioned individuals and communities in the most difficult situations and areas. So can you share some examples of how you are doing that? Sí, buenas tardes. Muchas gracias por la invitación. Bueno, eh, nosotros en calidad de academia, voy a empezar hablando de, de Perú propiamente. Somos un país de, ten, de ten, 34 millones de, de personas. Eh, aproximadamente el 66% corresponde a la eh, población rural y el 35% básicamente es a la, a la población urbana. Eh, dicho esto, eh, hemos podido identificar como país diferentes indicadores para reducir la brecha digital, tales como la conectividad de Internet, el acceso a dispositivos digitales, el acceso a la educación digital, eh, el despliegue de los servicios digitales públicos y además de la inclusión digital propiamente. El INICTEL UNI, eh, como academia, contribuye a la reducción de esta brecha digital a través de sus programas de capacitación gratuitos. Estos programas están dirigidos para personas con discapacidad motora, discapacidad visual. Asimismo, eh, cubrimos también eh, al grupo de pobladores rurales que menos conectividad tienen. Eh, para nosotros es todo un, un reto trabajar est estas estos, estos grupos debido a que se trabaja en cooperación con los gobiernos locales y con organismos internacionales sin fines de lucro. Actualmente nosotros hemos capacitado a 74 millones de personas en este grupo de personas vulnerables. Eh, propiamente nuestro, nuestra capacidad eh, financiera es limitada, sin embargo, en calidad de academia nosotros trabajamos eh, las necesidades propias de cada grupo. En el caso de, 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 de los desplazamientos, para ver cómo podemos llevar la, eh, un temario adecuado para cubrir una necesidad específica. Es lo que puedo comentar desde la parte de la academia. very much for that. It is very, very interesting. You also mentioned, like, uh, um, like Alfie, the need for cooperation with partners, really building that ecosystem. And also uh, what's, what's important is in what you raised is the identif identification of needs of the communities you're addressing. So now I'll turn to Giovanna Botani. Giovanna, these were some great examples from the Americas region. And ST Foundation, we talked about partners. You're a partner mm -hmm. of the Digital Transformation Center Initiative. And the foundation has been rolling out digital inclusion training interventions. You have your Digital Unify program. And again, you focus on underserved groups, such as seniors, persons with visual impairments, etc. So why have you prioritized these uh, digital inclusion programs focusing on these populations. And can you as well share some contributions, considerations, and lessons learned? Yes. Well, first of all, uh, good afternoon to everyone, and thank you for this very interesting and insightful question. 
I would say that uh, the reason why we are focusing our attention on, spe on specific publics like the elderly, like, like the visually impaired people, like women, is rooted in the why we were created. We were created uh, in 2001 in order to reply to uh, the call to action of the former UN Secretary General, Mr. Kofi Annan, to fight against the digital divide in the most underprivileged areas across the world. I would say that since then, we've been um, and we've become like a sentinel of urgencies and needs. And on this basis, since the beginning, we have identified the countries, we have identified the needs, and we have identified the courses and the contents to reply to these needs. Coming back to uh, your question, I would like just to share with you some figures, some numbers. So uh, let's think and brainstorm together about the fact that nowadays more than 253 million people are actually blind or visually impaired. And 90% of these people come from very at risk and underprivileged situation. Likewise, if we think about the elderly, for instance, we know that by year uh, 2050, over 2 billion people will be aged um, 60 years and plus. And last but not least, um, we all know that 2.6 billion people are cut off from the benefits technology can offer, and the majority of them, of course, is represented by women, women in difficult situations. And therefore, if we can really want to create what we call an inclusive society, we need to think about the urgencies that we are facing, we need to uh, think about the needs, and especially we need to think about the last mile, I would say where the unprivileged people are. And therefore, we decided to create, let's say, dedicated courses and learning path to address these, uh, um, these beneficiaries. And beforehand, what we tried to do in these scenarios was really to understand their urgencies and uh, uh, their needs. And I just would like to share with you some, let's say, reflections also on the why. Um, we want to create, as I was saying before, an inclusive society. So we expect that everyone will contribute in a positive way, right? In a positive way to society, because we want them to access a decent work, better education, or simply to live uh, a less, uh, let's say, uh, a long life. We all remember the tragedy represented by COVID-19. In European countries, the elderly were cut off everything. Were cut off everything. And thanks to technology, we were able to build bridges. So our role as the, as the foundation really is addressing the last mile in order to build these bridges for an inclusive society. Thank you very much, uh, Giovanna, and I agree there is really that urgency. And I also agree that ad addressing the needs and assessing the needs is key to be able to respond to those needs. And I'll share with you a story. It really is that, set, that inclusiveness. My father was a civil servant. He was a diplomat. And when he grew old and my, I lost my mother, he was alone. His son was in Africa and his daughter was, uh, was in Portugal, so not in Belgium. And at the same time, he, he got visual impairments, so he got glaucoma and he couldn't see. For him, giving him an accessible computer was a window back into life because he could talk to his children. So he, it was his way out of loneliness. So I totally agree, we need to be inclusive and we need to assess those needs. So turning to you, Ajay Kusumani Ngahatri, as a representative of a, te of a telecommunication company, we're in your hands as well. You have <coughs> various digital inclusion programs in Indonesia. So can you tell us more about how your telecommunication companies 
can help to bridge the digital skills gap. It's not just about infrastructure, it's about more. So from your experience, what is the recipe for success? Thank you so much, Sophie, for the questions. Um, so just to give um, an idea of why, why Indosat is doing what they're doing, is that because we are one of the telecommunication industry, uh, company in Indonesia, and we are really committed in um, deepening this um, digital inclusion, you know, sorry, closing the gap for the digital inclusion, um, because one of our vision in the next few years is to become AI nation, sorry, AI native um, telco, which then we need more AI digital talents, and in order for us to achieve that vision, we think that we need to focus more on also digital literacy, back, back to the basics. Now, um, we believe that connectivity is foundations. Of course, we discuss about it uh, since uh, this morning. But also with connectivity, we, we also believe uh, there are programs to improve how people can connect to digital, the digital world better. So then w they will have like a digital um, a better opportunity in terms of um, how to reach out, uh, out there. So just to give you an example or just to give you an idea of um, how many people in Indonesia they are not yet connected to the internet, we have 280 million population of people and 40% of those people are not yet connected, which is around 90 90 million people that are not connected. Um, so there are a lot of work back at home. So that's why the next thing that I want to address is that working together uh, with government, community, as well as um, educational institutions are very like the key to our um, collaboration program. It's because with government, the Indonesian government actually has created um, a very supportive regulations in terms of how we can uh, scale up our digital programs, but also we work together with community leaders that are uh, very, very uh, close to the culture within the regions because in Indonesia we have 17,000 islands, so that's a lot of islands, right? So that's why we need community leaders to be trained and also keep up update with um, what's happening or digital skills that are needed. Um, that's why then when we reach to the people, which then in Indonesia we have this term as 3T, actually in um, English we call it regions that are outer, um, outermost, underdeveloped, and frontier. So we chose from those areas and then we develop the, the leaders. So we, we work closely, so they have um, local contacts. When they learn about digital um, skill, they have local contacts. So that's why it's easier for the people that are in our program to understand better why they need this and why they need to keep on upskilling their already like existing skill. Um, and educational um, institutions are there for us to be able to also reach out to the youth because this is the next generation. So Indonesian are make up like around like 52% of our people are now in the age of 16 to 40. So this is, this is why we need um, educational institutions to work with us together to make sure that everyone is keep up with the digital skill that is needed. Thank you very much. It really is all about the ecosystem, that inclusiveness. Uh, and it is also, as Alfie mentioned, the train the trainer to ensure the sustainability. And you touched upon an important point as well, which is the local context. So, and as you mentioned, the needs of the project. So I'm getting some key words that we all agree on uh, that, that <coughs> it's important to be able to bridge those, um, the digital skills gap. So Abina, GIFEC is one of the ITU digital transformation centers. So as part of this program, you've been extremely successful in reaching out to communities across Ghana and delivering that digital skills training. So how do you ensure that inclusion, but also the infrastructure and access to digital skills training? And what are some of the biggest challenges and obstacles you face when you want to bring, bridge that digital skills divide? And what are you doing to address those obstacles? All right. Thank you so much, Sophie. And good afternoon, everyone. Um, given by the nature of our existence, we are a universal access fund. Um, an agency under the Ministry of Communications, 
and digitalization. And um, we attempt to fill the void created by the mobile network companies like um, AJ. And um, these, so we focus on communities that do not meet the um, commercial eligibility criteria of this mobile network organizations. To talk about connectivity, we all agree that connectivity is the bedrock on which all digital skills efforts rest. So in GIFEC, we are committed to ensuring connectivity in rural areas through one of our flagship projects called the Ghana Rural um, Telephony and Digital Inclusion Project. This is a wholly government-funded project, and we are looking at constructing 2016 cell sites in rural Ghana. And when this is completed, hopefully we are looking at completing it early next year. What this is going to do is going to provide voice and data services to 4 million rural Ghanaians. And I think this is a very big thing. Aside the work that the government is doing, we also work with the private sector to ensure a very rapid rollout in rural areas. We've worked with companies like GSMA. We're working with several local mobile network operators to ensure that this is done. And in GIFEC, we are very deliberate about our rollout. We ensure that connectivity goes with access to digital inclusion. And what, what we mean by this is every community that we connect, we make sure that at least there is a cyber laboratory in there that helps the local community people to also have a taste of digitalization. We have projects like the School Connectivity Project, which ensures that ICT laboratories are set up in primary and secondary schools. And we have the community ICT centers these are ICT centers located in various rural um, communities, which enables people to come in there and also have a taste of digitalization. We have over 200 of these community ICT centers, and out of this, we are using 151 centers for the digital inclusion project, um, yeah, the DTC project. And this has really been instrumental in the rollout that we've done. When Dr. Cosmos was speaking in the morning, he mentioned that DTC, I stand to be corrected, uh, Robin, DTC has trained over 34,000 people. And Ghana alone, we've trained over 20,000 people. I think we deserve an applause for that. Yeah, so um, we are doing enormously well. In terms of inclusion, if you know the Minister of Communication, Ms. Osla, and even my CEO who I came with, um, Eva Ando, they are women. So the people spearheading digitalization in Ghana are women. Aside that, we adopt two approaches in our inclusion endeavor. We approach it community-wide and also on individual basis. In Ghana, in our rural communities, the traditional leaders speak and it's law. So we work with these people to ensure that they get their people to understand the benefits of digitalization. And also, on individual basis, Giovanna was very elaborate with the work we are, they are doing with the persons with disabilities. We also try as much as possible to engage rural women, women entrepreneurs, the youth, as well as people who need the, these skills most. And um, I'll end by saying that some of the obstacles that we've faced in the past is the literacy. People lack the basic literacy to get adapt to digital skills. And also we have challenges with sustaining some of our ICT labs, which I can talk more in the next round. Thank you very much. so much and again some interesting perspectives you did focus uh, you did mention that focusing on infrastructure is still key and I think we all agree with that uh, we do need to look at the unserved and underserved areas but you also mentioned the partnerships the ecosystem and I think one of the things you brought into the conversation as well and it comes to one of the points the director made yesterday is innovation right 
So you talked about innovative financing mechanisms or innovative mechanisms to achieve universal access and service. You mentioned the community centers, so the anchor institutions. You mentioned about, um, again, assessing the needs. You mentioned about focusing on specific groups. So I think these are all points that we've taken aboard and that we'll definitely take aboard in, in our summary report and the conclusions. I see our chairman here. The summary conclusions of this forum will definitely include some of these points. Now, before we go to the second round of questions, are there any questions from the audience? Is there anything, and if we could switch on the lights so that if we can see any hands up, uh, any questions from the audience? If not, well, I'll turn back to the panelists, but I just want to give a little chance for anybody from the audience. Excellent, I can see the lights are on. Thank you very much. On the left-hand side, can you identify? Yes. The gentleman with his hand up, please take the floor. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, I'm Dada from Senegal. And uh, thank you for that initiative. And uh, congratulations for all of you doing good jobs in your countries uh, in terms of uh, filling the gap in the digital skills. But I have a concern. Uh, on the one hand, uh, all those initiatives uh, are being taken by government to promote, uh, or, or to fill uh, that gap. But on the other hand, the same governments are shutting down the internet. So how do you guys uh, handle that contradiction? Thank you. I'm wondering if anybody in the panel, and I think we'll generalize it more, because in the questions that we had to the various panelists, we talked about how do you overcome the challenges. And I think all of you, all of you, mentioned the need for the ecosystem and to work with partners. All of you mentioned the need not just to work with government, but also local communities, local governments. Alfie in particular mentioned for sustainability, the working with the ecosystem and really training the trainers is key to what you're doing. So can we take the question in, in that more positive spin to see why is that ecosystem so important? How do you balance different agendas, the different interests, so that together we can work together to achieve our aims? Anybody that would like to answer that? I'll Let's take that question. So uh, it's about you know governments shutting down the internet. So I think what is important, and, and I go back to my time in South Africa, uh, where my responsibility was to take um, IT into schools in, in in the country. And they, what we did, and you find that it won awards in Europe, etc., uh, as being one of the best digital education initiatives in, in on the continent. What we'd done at that time was, before even putting any computers into schools or training any teachers, the first thing we did was to train the government officials, the ones at the top. You need to show them what the benefit of digital technologies is. You need to show them what the benefit of digital skills is. Once they understand that and they see how it's going to benefit the country as a whole, then you have the support from the top and the very last thing that's going to be on the mind is to shut down the internet. So it's how you implement your initiatives that's important. Right? You need to take all stakeholders along with you. Don't leave anyone behind, especially those who are responsible for taking decisions. That is how, what I would advise you to do in your, in your countries. Anybody else want to jump in? Yeah, so... Um, yes. okay. Claro. Hola, Sorry. Have a... Sí. Eh, bueno, en Perú, sí, en Perú eh, el Ministerio de Transportes y Comunicaciones es la encargada de llevar la infraestructura a todas la, las comunidades, eh, tanto urbanas como rurales. Eh, nosotros como academia, al igual que mi compañero, eh, básicamente tomamos el pilar de las capacitaciones de formadores 
eh, para, para luego llegar de manera individualizada a cada uno de los participantes. Sin embargo, eh, es una tarea de todos eh, tener la implementación de esta infraestructura o tener implementada básicamente porque eh, el, la pandemia nos ha obligado a países eh, emergentes como es el Perú a evaluar esta necesidad y, y tomar el toro por las astas, se dice en Perú, cuando eh, hemos tenido la necesidad de llevar de pronto eh, simuladores, para, sobre todo para personas que menos acceso tienen a al tema de Internet es todo un reto para nosotros. Y desde ahí nosotros podemos contribuir como academia, como socios de, de, de diferentes organizaciones sin fines de lucro y además trabajar de la mano con los gobiernos locales. Thank you very much. Yeah, so what I can add is <clears throat> One of the things that we've been very successful with is co-creating, um, especially content with um, the local communities. We rely most on the digital content from Cisco and our other partners. But don't know standing. We still negotiate with them, let them understand what we are offering them to ensure that the content is culturally relevant and it helps them advance their various trade and ethically, you know, um, considered so that they, they can also buy into what we are offering them. And also my issues with disinformation and misinformation are also really taken care of. When this is done, they really understand that digital skills is the new order. We had a very funny um, situation where I went to the village and my grandmother went like, um, you don't really have an excuse. She handed me her feature phone, not even a smartphone. They said, now they said you can put it on it. Meaning mobile money. They don't really understand what it is, but they know that something is there and something is here to change how things are done. So um, I think co-creating content, co-creating other digital solutions really works and it's going to help us a lot. Thank you. Thank you very much. So thank you for that particular question. And I, may I challenge you, Alfie, because you mentioned you need to convince government. Yes, absolutely, you need to convince government. And indeed, one of the major projects we're working at, on at ITU as well as the project on universal and meaningful connectivity, and one of the key pillars of that project as well is advocacy, really bringing the policy makers on board not just the regulators, but the policy makers on board to explain what is universal and meaningful connectivity. But if I've had the honor of working with the ITU outside and inside for over 30 years, and I remember doing national school connectivity countries in some countries, some of whose representatives are there. And I think we also mentioned bringing in the community leaders, because I think there's still a lot of fear. And we all know the internet is a huge opportunity, but it also has its immense challenges. It's scary. It's scary for us parents. It's scary to keep our children safe. It's scary for people that, who do not have the skills. So I think we also need to demystify. We need to be aware of the challenges and the opportunities. So when we were doing the Connect to School, Connect to Community, we worked with community leaders. We worked with the chiefs of the villages to demystify the internet. Also, the education ministries, they actually need to include digital skills in the curriculum. In one of the countries I was, I remember we went to visit a school just outside of the capital, and the headmistress actually had computers in the schools, but when the inspectors came, she had to run to hide them because it wasn't part of the syllabus. So these are all elements that we need to think, and we insisted upon them, ecosystem, awareness raising, really that partnerships. So I think those, I hope that answers your question to the gentleman from Senegal. I don't see any other questions right now, so let me turn back to my panelists for a second round of questions, two minutes each. I think we're good on time, we still have more than half an hour. So Alfie, 
Could you please share more on Cisco's contribution and support to ICT capacity development interventions globally? And what, again, what are some of these challenges and constraints to bridge the digital skills gap? And what are you doing to address these challenges? Great, thanks, Sophie. So at Cisco, we have a program that's called the Networking Academy Program. Uh, this is the largest and most longest running digital skills program in the industry. Uh, so I'm sitting here quite proud to say that there is no other private sector company who can lay claim to that. Uh, every year, we train over 4.5 million students. But that, as, my, uh, as Chris mentioned earlier, is only a drop in the ocean. Now, how do we do that? If we had to go and look at the program, and this is what's so unique about it, is that only 23% of the content that's in the program has anything to do with Cisco. So the digital skills program is not about promoting Cisco. It's about saying, how do we truly make an impact on the world that we find, in the world that we find ourselves in. It's about being a true global citizen and caring for the people that you find yourselves uh, where you do, do business. You'll find that this program is present in every single country. But Cisco doesn't do business in every single country in the world. So how do we do that? We partner with governments, with schools, colleges, universities, NGOs, NPOs, and we, as long as you are a non-for-profit company or organization, you can sign up to be part of the initiative on condition that we are giving you this program that has immense value. It has courseware from introductory to advanced level, and it's recognized by industry. But the condition that we put on you is that you need to pass on that goodwill. When you give it to your community, you're getting it free from Cisco. You need to also pass it on free to your community. Uh, and that is how we've been doing it for the past 27 years. And it's become uh, an immense global success. Thank you very much, Alfie, and very, very encouraging. And it's pay it forward, right? So it's pass it on. So um, Iris. Based on your experience in delivering basic digital skills training among rural communities, again, what were some of the main challenges and lessons learned? A ver, a ver dentro de, de nuestros desafíos, eh, bueno, en Perú, propiamente con el INIC del UNI, tenemos algunas iniciativas. También trabajamos con Cisco. Eh, somos centro de entrenamiento para docentes y para alumnos en la región propiamente, pero adicionalmente también contribuimos a través del programa eh, Partner to Connect con cuatro, eh, con cuatro compromisos con el cual estamos este, eh, relacionando todos los objetivos de desarrollo sostenible para el año 2024, eh, eh, ofreciendo la cobertura gratuita en los diferentes programas para mujeres, personas con discapacidad, nuevamente visual y motora, eh, asimismo este, para poblaciones rurales eh, con inclusión digital propiamente. ¿no? Eh, nuestro mayor reto realmente es romper, esa, la, romper la cultura, enseñarles la importancia del uso de las TIC ¿no? en, cualquiera de los, en cualquiera de los grupos vulnerables, eh, hacer que esto sea útil a nivel de empleabilidad y sobre todo que va a ser una herramienta muy potente para cada uno de ellos. ¿no? Eh, como comentabas anteriormente, es un poco romper el mito de que bueno, el, el Internet te apertura, pero también tienes que tener ciertos privilegios o restricciones. ¿no? Llevarles capacitación digital, eh, habilidades digitales, es una herramienta muy potente para cada uno de ellos. Yes, thank you very much. It really is uh, break those stigmas on ICTs, right? And, and, and be clear, inform, educate. Educate not about just the technology, but about the opportunities, about the challenges, and about the solutions to overcome those challenges and gain those opportunities. So, Giovanna, looking ahead, where do you see the ST Foundation expanding 
and are deepening its contributions to bridge the digital divide. So uh, looking ahead, I would say that we are working on a few but very solid pillars in order to, let's say, bridge the digital divide for the most uh, marginalized ones. Uh, well, the first element is to raise the bar because digital divide is something that is evolving and is evolving very, very fast. So we need to behave quicker. And therefore, we want to, uh, so to say, create advanced versions of all our actual courses. Uh, together with the content, we want to um, extend our reach and we cannot do it on our own. For us at the foundation, the second element, uh, together with raising the bar and finding the right partners to do it. One of the motto at the foundation is we have to co-create initiatives with the right partners. Why co-creation? Because it's thanks to the support of all of you that we can understand urgencies and needs in the different countries. And I would say uh, we need, when it contents, we need uh, a partnership, we need new trends. We are also reflecting a lot on uh, AI, for instance, how AI can be very, very useful for disabilities. And there are some, let's say, reflections on it. And last but not least is the concept of continuous learning. Why continuous learning? Because as I was saying just at the beginning, digital divide is going fast. 20, more than 20 years ago, when we started, for us, bridging the digital divide was to offer basic informatic courses. Now we're talking about artificial intelligence. So you see the gap, and we need to push all our students <coughs> and all our beneficiaries in continuing learning. This, I would say, is the, is the, uh, are the golden rules of the foundation and what we see for our future. Absolutely, and thank you very much. I think some of the points you raised, you said, and we know the digital divide, digital is evolving very quickly, but that means the digital divide is evolving quickly. So I think we need to, we need to be bold and brave. So there is a, that element of innovation. There is that element of adaptability. There is the element of co-creation, which we've heard a couple of times, and the continuous learning, but we need to work with government, Alfie. So there is that, that element of innovation and adaptability. There's that flexibility, but there's still the stability as well, because you as telecom companies, you have huge investments you make. So there, need, there needs to be that the stability, at least in the decision-making process, and also the inclusiveness, the transparency in the decision-making process, so that you have the confidence to continue to invest with these ever-evolving technologies. So I'll go to you, Ajeng. What recommendations would you give to telecoms companies, and can I challenge you, also governments? Okay. To those telecommunication companies who are interested in investing, and in bridging the digital skills divide. So I've added a little word, but that's just a challenge for you. Thank you, thank you, Sophie. So I think in terms of recommendations, um, telco, we have connectivity, and also government actually provide infrastructures, especially when the landscape is like Indonesia with 17,000 islands, so we cannot do it alone. So it's a homework for everyone, especially us um, private sectors that provide connectivity. Um, this is where we see that um, need assessment is really important because with different regions, there are local um, digital landscapes that we don't know. So that's why I, again, gonna say that we need community leaders that will um, help us in this as well. So, um, for example, Indosat has been expanding our um, 
connectivity to more rural areas. Where do we start? Like, where? How? So not only we work together with the government, but also we work sometimes with community leaders that are non, not from the technology side. It can be religious leaders as well. You know, making them understand um, why this is important for us as a telco company, bringing this um, digital skill to their areas and how it can help the development of their areas. Um, as well as leveraging the partnership together with uh, uh, part the right partners, like you said, um, like how we can bring the world outside of Indonesia to Indonesia, like when we work together with Cisco, we work together with Google, how we can bring this to the most, like the outer part of Indonesia, you know? We need government um, to give us access, but also we need community leaders to set the context and expectation of what they're going to learn and what they're going to achieve by working together with us, by us giving them the connectivity and them can learn, can use the digital platform better. I think those are the recommendations that I can, I can give because really partnerships are key for us telecommunication company as well. I think it's all about partnerships. And I haven't heard it yet, but I'm sure you'll all, all nod. It's partnerships and collaboration, right? Yeah. So collaboration is key. You mentioned the community leaders, that awareness raising. We can't assume that our policymakers will immediately know the needs of all the communities. So mm -hmm. that's why we need to work together to have that conversation. So we have that collaboration so that we assess and address the actual needs and so, so Adina, you've mentioned in Ghana, you mentioned your fabulous minister, you mentioned how you've worked with universal service, you've mentioned your community centers, and we've all talked about sustainability, right? Because it's not a flash in the pan. This is too important to set up projects that will fizzle out. So what measures have you taken to ensure the effect? So it's not just sustainability, it's scalability as well. How can we multiply? How can we get the village that educates the child, right? Also, so how can we get that village together and scale it up? And how we, can we sustain it at community, at country, at regional and global level? Can you share some, some thoughts with us? Certainly. Thank you very much. So um, talking about sustainability and scalability, we can look at it from two angles the training delivery itself, as well as the infrastructure. Um, for us in GIFEC, with the training delivery, just as Alfie said, we embark on training of the trainers. Well, each of the community centers that we have, or the digital transformation centers that we have, have their own trainers. And these people are recruited from the villages that um, we, they, we train the people in. So these centers are always open because we also have the challenge of devices. People, most households don't have their own um, household devices. So these centers are located within the communities. It's always available for members to go back for their refresher trainings when, when need be. We, we also work with the various community leaders, just as I mentioned previously, and um, Though these centers are located in the rural villages, it's challenged with resources, computers, and all that. There are instances you virtually have to move computers around just to ensure that um, um, you have the right resources. And in terms of the infrastructure, I think it's time that we start the conversation about after building ICT lab, how is it sustained? I think it's something that we don't really pay attention to. A lot of these telecenters in other countries are challenged. They are built with the notion of being a profit making and non for profit. Forgetting that these villages don't even have resources to maintain them. The resources that we put in are left to rot. How do we sustain them? I think it's a conversation that ITU should start how government can sustain ICT infrastructure because it's the building block, and without it, digital skills cannot go on. Thank you. Abina, can I throw this back at you? Because it's when you're building the telecenters and you're building the digital skills, you have the basic digital skills, the interim and the advanced digital skills. And when I, it, it's all about, we talked about demystifying digital, right? 
So it's really about not just how do I use a computer, but what, what do I use a computer for? Yeah. How can I use these skills I'm learning to make my life better? Mm -hmm. Get out of loneliness, but also set up a company. Find the prices of where, how, how expect, or at what cost can I sell my goods in the next village? Do I sell them here or do get, I get on my bike and sell them in the next village? So I think it's that as well that we as stakeholders need to have in our minds to say, not just how do we connect people, but it's that meaningful connectivity, right? How does it make our life better? Sorry, I don't want to take up all the time. All right. Alpha, go ahead. I just want to make a point that I think is very critical here, right? If we look at literacy, and UN does UN celebration literacy, right? And it's important that governments need to look at it this way. If we look at the 2.6 billion that are not connected, and of those people, the people are not uh, digitally literate. Now imagine in this room we're sitting in here, only half of you knew how to read and write and the other half didn't know how to read and write. That's not the ideal situation. Neither would you as a government want half of your population to be illiterate. But you're not coming on board and promoting digital literacy in your population. You are holding your country behind. That's what you're doing. So it's important that you as a partner, government partner, comes on board, partner with the people that are sitting here, to take digital literacy to every single citizen in your country. That is what we need to be doing in order to move into this fourth industrial revolution. Thank you very much, Alfie, for that very passionate plea. Do we have any more questions? And while I'm scanning the room for questions, again, I have a challenge for all my panelists. And I have my comms colleagues sitting here with me today. So we need tweets. So I want one sentence from each of you, please, just to say what is your key takeaway from our panel today as we wrap, wrap up. So one sentence. And I'm not talking about a 50-word sentence. I'm talking about a punchy sentence. So I'll give you a couple of minutes to think about that. I have warned you before. Um, any questions? Can I see any hands in the room? Please don't be shy. I see a hand back there with the orange, <laughs> same color as me. <laughs> Go ahead. Thank you so much. Again, it's Catherine from Tanzania. Um, I have learned a lot from this session because back in my country, especially where I work at the Open University of Tanzania, we have regional centers. We have centers in every region of Tanzania. And in some of these centers, we have computer labs. And it is very difficult to ensure that we reach out to communities, provide them with skills, and at the same time, maintain the infrastructure. And we also offer um, digital skills training to people with disabilities, and it is a free of charge. The university does not, uh, um, does not charge the community. Anybody with a disability can come at the university and learn on how to use the digital uh, devices and the digital technologies. Again, we cannot reach out. If the university, the government cannot reach out every person with disabilities. I remember we made a presentation to the um, parliament and the members of parliament, they were interested on one question. So you also need to come to my constituency to provide the digital skills to people with disabilities in my constituency, but how do we reach there? So again, one of the key um, one of the key issues that we have learned from this session, it is the implementation model on how to develop a sustainable way of providing the skills. Um, my last uh, contribution is to what uh, my sister Abena has said. 
I think we should also make the communities feel that these labs, these training centers are their babies, meaning that if we can connect the skills, the trainings to their day-to-day -day activities, especially the economic-based activities, if, we can, if the community is on fishing, if we can connect getting the digital skills in order to enhance fishing, in order to make their fishing more valuable to them, I think there is a possibility that we can make the communities feel like they are also responsible in maintaining, in sustaining these centers. So I think that's also a very good takeaway to develop impact-based training and not just digital skills training. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that comment and for that, those insights, and thank you for your appreciation for the panel. We have about 15 minutes left, so if anybody wants to react to that particular comment. Dina. Um, thank you very much, my sister from Tanzania. Um, in talking about how to mobilize trainers for especially um, persons with dis disability training, what we do in Ghana is to train the teachers in the various disability schools and also ensure that the schools have their own laboratory. Because remember, even bringing them to the centers, you are going to incur additional costs, so we try as much as possible to minimize the cost of training um, persons with disability, especially for um, the visual impairment. If you want a visual impairment to come to your center, remember you'll be incurring that cost in addition to his or her assistant. So we rather take the trainings to them, equip their teachers, and help them have their own laboratory to undertake this training. And with the maintaining the labs in Ghana, we've attempted to set up what we call sustainability management committee in our various ICT labs which on paper looked like a very beautiful idea, but when you go to the field, you have people making so many demands. The fact that they are a committee, they, you, they think that if they sit, they need to have an allowance. And these are some of the challenges that we are facing also with maintaining the lab. So maybe we can you know, compare notes and see if we can come up with other creative ways to manage our lab because it's a critical feature in building the digital skills ecosystem. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, so now let's go to the very short statements. I'll start with you, Alf. Um, the tagline would be uh, digital skills for a brighter future. Bueno, yo diría crear para aprender. Eh, es... <risa> ok. Eh, bueno, el lema de, de nosotros que se me ocurre en este momento es crear para aprender. Es una, va a ser una competencia muy buena la, la, la habilidad que tú puedas adquirir, que eso te lleva a, te, a repotenciar todas tus habilidades blandas o ya sea de conocimientos, ¿no? Thank you so much, Iris. Giovanna. Yes, I would say uh, co-creation and innovation at the heart <coughs> of fighting against the digital divide. Thank you, excellent. Okay, um, I'm going to be very short. It will be globally connected, locally empowered. Say technology is moving faster than the speed of light. Technology is moving faster than the speed of light, but my grandmother cannot be left behind. Mm -hmm. Those are all excellent conclusions. So I'm going to add to the conclusions. I'm just going to um, just summarize what we heard. We heard, of course, inclusiveness. We heard about sustainability. 
sustainability also meaning training for the maintenance, thinking about the future, but also making sure that the community itself knows how to benefit from the opportunity and how to maintain. We heard about transferring the assets. So that sustainability also means that you transfer the assets, the knowledge, so that people know how to continue with the project. Obviously, we heard about ecosystem building. We heard about co-creation, about collaboration. And when we talk about the ecosystem, it's from the top to the bottom. It's from the grassroots to the local communities, educational institutions, partners, government, policy makers. We heard about the sense of urgency, and all, we all agreed about the sense of urgency. It's urgent, and as Alfie said, we would never choose to exclude half of the world, as we would never choose to exclude half of our population. But you don't know what to fix until you know what to fix. So needs assessments are key. We really need to know where the gaps are so that we know where we channel our resources, where we channel our effort, which partners that we address and that we talk to. And let's not forget the local content as well. So you only know what you know until you, uh, when you know it. But also, if you're, if you're putting out content there that doesn't speak to the people, they won't be interested. We can have the best programs in the world to build digital skills. But as the colleague from Zambia mentioned this morning, if we're going to teach kids about you know, music that we, the older people, are interested in, they might not be that enthusiastic. On the other hand, we, as, dare I call ourselves, policy makers, regulators, the communities, the stakeholders, if we don't listen to our kids in what they want to know, we're going to continue to create content that doesn't interest them. So it really is about that. So the ecosystem, the local content, the train the trainer, the train the trainer, and the train the maintainer as well. I think we also heard that we need to focus on infrastructure, and that's where our government, our policymakers, our regulators come in, because we need those innovative mechanisms. Think about regulations, about policy, but also think about regulatory tools. Licensing, for example, can be a regulatory tool to reach those unserved and underserved areas. And when I say about licensing, it's not just imposing obligations. We can also ask the interested parties, what do you want to bring to, to the table? So when we're crafting licensing, licensing um, processes, maybe we we'll want to go for auctions, maybe we we'll want to go for beauty parades in which the evaluation criteria of the beauty parades are, what do you want to bring to the table? Maybe we want to think about pay or play mechanisms. Maybe we want to think about public-private partnerships or other novel financing approaches. So we do need to st think about, and obviously impacts. Oh, it's a shame our director has, a, has left because we are a BDT for impact. What counts for us is impact. And impact, you know on who? The people. Because at the end of the day, that's who we're working for. We want to break the stigmas, break the stylos, break the st stigmas, and demystify the internet while being aware of the challenges. I'm a parent, my son's already 28 years old, so I don't have to look over his shoulder. But I remember when he was tiny, small, there, were, there are challenges. So we need to demystify, but we also need to educate about the challenges and the tools that we have to do those challenges. We need to set the context. You said it, community leaders need to set the context. So we need to set and understand the content. And we need to co-create with our partners. And as you said, that continuous learning, right? We need to continue to listen, learn, collaborate. With that, I'd like to really, really thank my panelists. I'd like to thank the team, Robin. Thank you for helping setting up and facilitate this particular panel. And thank you to the audience for listening and for
appreciating this panel and really look forward to continuing our conversations and our collaborations over the next couple of days, months, years. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, our dear panelists. Thank you very much, Ms. Sophie, for moderating this uh, very fruitful session. Ladies and gentlemen, now we are going to take a half an hour coffee break. I do urge you to go visit the ITU booth to meet representatives of the ATCs, Afratif from Kenya and NRD Cybersecurity from Lithuania, the DTCs, uh, GIFEC from Ghana, and partners of the DTC Initiative, SD Foundation, and to join up and to join the sign up raffle. Ladies and gentlemen, we'll be back here at uh, 3.15 for the National Digital Skills Framework for a policy making session. Actually, uh, it will be at 3. 45, my apologies. So we'll see you back here in half an hour. Enjoy your break.